you might not say that Philadelphia in the late 18th century was, was like 5th century Athens exactly, but you could certainly say that it was a magnet city for the Enlightenment in a, in a global sense of the word. Not only was it associated with very famous scientists and free thinkers and innovators of the, of the native uh, school, Benjamin Franklin obviously being the best, the man who uh, probably discovered, could be said to have discovered at least the uses of electricity, if not electricity itself, the applications of it, and a prodigious writer about natural philosophy, but also men like Joseph Priestley, uh, the discoverer of oxygen, who when his uh, laboratory in Birmingham was destroyed, smashed, by a mob shouting for church and king because of his defense of revolutionary ideas and because of his Unitarianism, took his broken instruments and his, the remains of his burned books and crossed the Atlantic and headed for Philadelphia, as did the greatest Englishman and the greatest American of them all, Thomas Paine, wafted across on the same tide of ideas and, and uh, innovation and free thinking with a letter in his pocket of introduction from Benjamin Franklin when he arrived. Mr. Jefferson was a very distinguished member of this group, too. Um, he helped, for example, Dr. Jenner to refine the idea of inoculation against uh, smallpox um, at a time when America's leading divine, uh, Timothy Dwight, one of the founders of Yale University, said that inoculation was profane because it was an interference with God's design, which, given God's design of the idea of smallpox in the first place, presumably inoculation is an interference with that, with that design. Uh, Jefferson managed to find a way of conveying the vaccine uh, from state to state without it going uh, sour, as it were, without it losing its potency, by keeping it chilled. Um, he helped to teach Lewis and Clark on their expedition crossing the United States, discovering its new boundaries, how to apply these inoculations when they met Indian peoples. He taught them cartography taught them astronomy and navigation in every sense, could have taught them if he'd wanted to, quite a bit about agriculture, viniculture, and the law of the sea. When there was a question of a treatise on whaling, Mr. Jefferson wrote an account of the problem himself, uh, just to establish what was known or not knowable about these things. It was a time when the frontiers of knowledge were considered to be almost contiguous with the frontiers of of liberty. I suppose that's one definition of the Enlightenment, the belief that knowledge is power, and powerfully exemplified in the life of Philadelphia at that time. And this extraordinary coincidence of, of men and ideas at one moment leads to the seizing of an opportunity to declare independence from the hated Hanoverian crown and to establish for the first time, and this is my second point in a way, the first ever and still the first and only republic in human history that explicitly separates the church and the state, that says in terms, in written documents, that, are, that remain a work in progress subject to revision and amendment, and thus make this the great subject for any writer, the American Republic, that uh, the, the word God has no place in official discourse. The American Constitution does not mention the word God at any point. It deliberately excludes it, except when mentioning the necessity of separating religion from politics. And when God is mentioned platonically, so to speak, or maybe neo-platonically, in documents like the Declaration, he's evoked by those who consider themselves to be deists, in other words, those who do not believe that God intervenes in human affairs, of whom Jefferson, if he wasn't an atheist, which I think he probably was, certainly was uh, a deist, a Unitarian, one who did not believe in divine intervention. It's a, a, a prize almost beyond all, all value or computation. That at last, the world of European theocracy, the divine right of kings, that the endless tyranny over the mine has been smashed and broken in a, in, a, in a country that has a fair chance of growing, of becoming a nation, of ceasing to be what it was at the time of the revolution, roughly that's to say the equivalent to North America of what Chile now is to South America, that's to say a long ribbon of territory between the mountains and the sea on the coast, and to become a continental republic. It becomes that principally because, again I'm condensing, of the bravery of the Haitian Revolution. The ideas of the French Revolution uh, inspire a slave rebellion in Haiti led by the first real slave general of genius in Spartacus, Toussaint Louverture, who takes the ideas of uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité and turns them on the French Empire, destroys a French army, destroys a French fleet, uh, raises the standard of the first uh, black republic in the hemisphere and forces Bonaparte to sell not just the town of New Orleans but the whole of 
Louisiana and beyond, doubling the size of the United States in one day to Thomas Jefferson, oddly enough, on the 4th of July, 1801. So that when the Lewis and Clark expedition sets out to prospect the interior and look for a frontier in California, they're able to tell the Indian peoples with whom they meet that they already live in the United States and that the reign of British and French and Spanish crowns in North America is over forever. An extraordinary lifetime, and I've only uh, dwelt on a little bit of it, but shadowed uh, all of it, every bit of it, every single bit of it, by the taint of slavery, which, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, is very much in our atmosphere this year with the anniversary of Mr. Wilberforce's triumph. Even, it's even present, actually, in the idea of the Enlightenment and the struggle to apply knowledge and technique to liberation, because it turns out that not all devices are liberating. Not all technology is labor-saving, after all. Um, the cotton gin, Mr. Whitney's great invention, it turns out prolongs slavery, makes it more profitable for many more years. Uh, so even the ideas of new machinery uh, can be made into weapons of alienation against people whose labor is extracted from them by force, people who are owned as property. So even in the Enlightenment vision, there's a negation. It has to be said that the same is true of the expansion of the country. When Thomas Jefferson bought Louisiana and doubled the size of the country, Thomas Paine came to him and Joel Barlow came to him and many other of his old Philadelphia comrades came to him and said, we can start again, we can start anew, we can start without the original sin of the country, we can start without the stain of slavery, which in the Constitution had defined an African as worth three-fifths of a human being for voting purposes. We can begin again without slavery, again because of the influence this time of the um, sugar interest Jefferson needed or felt he needed to continue the institution of slavery and to expand it into the new territories. Uh, and so it shadows even this moment of the liberation of the rest of the continent and actually bodies forth the likelihood of civil war because the new states cloned from Louisiana are going to equalize with the number of free states in time. And once the union is half slave and half free, there can only be one issue which, alas, Mr. Jefferson passes on to his descendants and to Mr. Lincoln to solve. Mr. Lincoln being born, by the way, Abraham Lincoln, on the very same day of the very same month of the very same year as Charles Darwin. Um, Mr. Darwin is just out of sight of Mr. Jefferson when he prospects in uh, Virginia and uh, looks at the topography and wonders how it is the shells are quite as high as they are on the mountaintop can't yet quite work out why it is. He can go no further than deism in his rejection of divine intervention, just on the cusp of, of the enlightenment that will show to humans that ethics and politics and life is possible without God altogether.